right. Good afternoon. Today is uh, Sunday, 20th of December, 2020. I'm here with uh, Councilman Scott Hamblin from Ward 6 of Overland Park, and I am Faris Farisadi, Ward 5, Overland Park. Uh, we are having our regular conversation series back, and we are glad to be with you. Uh, and before we start the title of conversation today, I would like to uh, say Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to all of you. We are just five days away from Christmas. I wish you the best of health. I wish you the best of uh, prosperity, joy with your family. We are glad that we are talking to you again when the vaccines are delivering and the, this pandemic is on its last uh, months, so to speak. So it's a, it's a good time. We have had a lot happening to us during this, this year, Councilman Hamblin, Scott. And I think it's a, it's a good time. We are opening our eyes to, to a new world. And uh, this, the topic of today's discussion is uh, the COVID relief funds. The CARES Act funds that come to the city of Overland Park and a lot of experts would tell you that the medical consequences of this pandemic would be much uh, shorter than the economic consequences of this pandemic. Uh, the vaccine would help the health of the people and the economy to come back, but we have the tail of it for a while on the back of our economy. So uh, there are funds allocated to the city of Overland Park, there are funds allocated to the Johnson County. Today's discussion is mainly focused on the funds that come to the city of Overland Park with the promise of being uh, spent on supporting businesses and individuals. And we wanna inform you about how to apply for them and also a little bit of the, some of the strategy and policies that the, your local government in Overland Park uh, is pursuing. So with, with that, I'm gonna welcome Councilman Hamblin and we, we're gonna start. Scott, you. So, yeah. I'm, re I'm ready when you are. And... All right, okay. So first of all, I think it, the best thing, one of the best things we could do is that I'm gonna show you a few slides about these funds, both of them, the ones for business and the ones for individual uh, assistance. The, uh, the uh, December 2nd, we had a community development meeting about these items. And this presentation that I'm gonna show to you is the same presentation that uh, was there by our staff on December 2nd. The December 2nd uh, meeting was uh, probably the third and four or fourth meeting that we had on how to dispense these funds. These funds uh, so far have arrived in two allocations. One allocation of it is distributed and I have posted on my Facebook and I believe Scott has done that in order to notify uh, the constituents of availability of them. And now the second allocation of them <coughs> is arriving and is being uh, prioritized, so to speak, in the tunes of probably seven, eight hundred thousand dollars So we're going to take a look at what happened to the first allocation, and then we're going to discuss what is going to happen to second allocation, how to apply for it, and the policies that uh, are being uh, essentially uh, proposed to regulate the distribution of the second allocation. So let me share my screen with you. So here we're going to start from the beginning. This is the, could you, Scott, do you see my screen? Just. Absolutely, yep. So the overall title of these funds is Community Development Block Plan Program that we have had in Overland Park. Now this is the COVID edition of it, essentially money coming from CARES Act, but the mechanism of distribution of this is still referred to as CDBG or Community Development Block Grant Program. Now, uh, the, well, as I said, there were two mechanisms, there were two allocations, one in support of uh, small business economic relief, and the other one was in support of individuals. And when we say individuals, that meant uh, mostly for the rent or utility. So <clears throat> the first allocation of CDBG for a small business support, uh, $347,000 was available to assist OPS small businesses. It could provide uh, rent or mortgage assistance for these businesses. 
And we very strongly argued uh, with the rest of the committee back when we were deciding about that, that this should go to low and very low income businesses, meaning that uh, businesses that employ low and very low income individuals. Because it's just, uh, just simply a concept that was agreeable uh, by the constituents that low and very low income individuals are gonna be uh, of higher priority. Scott, I believe you uh, researched the hard uh, reference for low and very low income. So can you please tell us, when we say low and very low income people, what sort of parameters applies there? So from the information I got from HUD, it was 80% of the county median um, income would qualify you as moderate. Um, and then from there, it, it, and that was in the, in the vicinity of $86,000 um, for Johnson County, meaning that uh, uh, moderate uh, qualification starts somewhere around, I think it was 69,000. Uh, and then the low starts around 50% and goes down for there. And then there's a very low uh, underneath that even. Um, but that is where they derive the, the numbers for uh, what, what is low and moderate income. Okay. So because, again, this money is also from federal government channels too hot, then it's appropriate for our city, for administration to consider the hot definition, essentially. So what I'm trying to say is that Scott is giving you the hot definition. If you go on internet <coughs> and look at low, very low income, moderate income, there could be other definitions as well. We are referring uh, our conversation on the hot uh, standard. So at that time, this is like uh, probably about two and a half months ago, it took quite a bit of energy to convince the, a number of members on the, on the committee that low and very low income families should be uh, prioritized. But it was prioritized. And if you look at this slide, it essentially tells you that uh, business recipients committed to creating or retaining jobs for low income individuals. That means low and very low income uh, individuals. So this was given to them with that, uh, with that uh, level of uh, promise and obligation. And we uh, uh, hired the company com community, the non-for-profit non community, capital fund to do this on behalf of the city. And they have an administrative cost, which is about, how much was it, Scott, about 10%? Uh, 10%? 12%. 12%. 12%. So again, I think the staff uh, came to this conclusion that they could not do it in-house and they had to be hired by them. And then there was a level of social media advertisement. So deserving businesses would apply. And we had the staff available to uh, provide information if they came to City Hall at the uh, Myron building that they could uh, come and ask questions. So uh, this is the results of what came out of that. Uh, 54 applications received about uh, a number of them from minority businesses, from women owned businesses. And then if you break it by the wards, you see that ward one, two, and three had the highest number of the applications and four, five, six had the lowest number of applications. So one more time, this indicates that where the need it should be uh, considered for these funds if you are going after low and very low income businesses. Any comments you have, Scott, here? No, and, and yeah, I mean, I think it, it shows kind of ward one goes, you know, we're kind of looking at a north to south. Um, I can tell you on Ward 6, I reached out to two of the uh, approved applications came uh, from me personally reaching out to a couple businesses. So, uh, you know, without that, we might have been at three applications in Ward 6. But um, so, yeah, I think, it, I think it accurately depicts, you know, where the need is or, um, you know, where, where the concentration of communication was. Excellent. And then... Now we are looking at what I call individual assessment or public assistance and service program. So $80,000 in the first allocation were available. Again, we really tried hard to focus that on low and very low income individuals. And uh, the, uh, it comes, it's on the second line, must serve low and very low income. And five applications 
were received. And these funds are not out yet. These funds have been given to a number of charities that they will give it out. And I'm gonna show you who those charities are. You can apply if you need it. You can still apply. There is still time to apply. And they are gonna uh, distribute that. Uh, I encourage anybody who watches this conversation to uh, just communicate with friends, family members, neighbors, whoever might need it and uh, apply for this fund. $105,000, it was $80,000. Our staff tried to inject some more money that they had in the CDBG program to it and to, to cover that gap. Uh, <clears throat> a specific recommendation uh, for the next, for it will follow actually. But uh, what we have here is that these are the list of the charities that uh, have received I've got commitment from the city to distribute these funds. Catholic Charities, Jewish Community Services, Metro Lutheran Ministries, and Safe Home. And that's $80,000 altogether. And there's another $15,000 which our staff are uh, injecting to this program. So now somebody who is late, who's late on rent, somebody who's late on utilities <clears throat> can go and involve with these charities and put an application in. In terms of what application, what characteristics they have, they are designing their own application, so you need to communicate with them. Any comments, Scott, that you have on this? No, nope, that's... And so, uh, the second allocation now is uh, basic, basically uh, going to be released to, during the <clears throat> next year. So, Overland Park will receive $781,000 of additional funding, spending through September 2022. Uh, any fine funding that is left from first allocation would switch to second allocation. And I believe from the business allocation, there is gonna be another $100,000, which it has not been distributed yet, and would switch to the second allocation and would, would not go back, would become available. Uh, the, the technicality here essentially is that for the second allocation, <clears throat> The, we could, I could not convince the rest of the committee that it should be focused also on low and very low income businesses and, and families. And uh, it, I still wanted to, to, to do that. And remember that it was for the first two months. So if in the first two months there was not enough applicants, then the others could apply. But this time, unfortunately, we didn't have the agreement of the committee to even prioritize low and very low income. Uh, families and businesses, and I think we get to that a little bit later. So then um, for the second allocation, which will be distributed during the next year, these are the programs that they have defined. A small business economic recovery assistance, and which is job retention and micro enterprise. Now, $385,000, $165,000, the microenterprise characteristics is interesting because in the first allocation, if you didn't have an employee and you were the only employee of your own business, you wouldn't qualify. This one in the microenterprise track, according to my conversation with the staff, even if you are a single owner of a, a business, you qualify essentially to apply for that, which, you know, hypothetically is a, uh, is, is a good, is a good thing to be pursued. Yeah. And um, and yes, Scott, go ahead, please. No, I was going to say that. That's the way I understood it too. You know, in in this round, if if you if you run a you know just a, a small business by you know yourself as the only employee running out of your home, um, you you actually qualify as a micro enterprise this time. Right. Which is good. Which is because like I had people specifically, you know, I actually uh, told them that go apply, and they came back and said. I am just one person uh, in this business and I didn't apply. And you can really appreciate that a lot of pressure is on those type of businesses. So it's, there is a lot of need there. And then the public assistance and services is $186,000. And the application for charities are open. One more time, you, you as an individual uh, cannot apply to Overland Park to get it, but if you have kind of, if you know charities who are interested and have the mechanism to dispense these funds, encourage them to apply. Obviously, the charities who worked with Overland Park 
and I showed them uh, to you are probably Catholic charities and these four charities are gonna be uh, hopefully helping, but I really look forward to other charities to come forward and try to distribute this to deserving people. One more time, it's, uh, it's up to uh, moderate income levels. Uh, Scott, what is the moderate income levels according to HUD? Um, so like I, I said earlier, it's, um, it's gonna be a 67,000. Um, and I wanted to uh, talk about that a little bit uh, with you being on the uh, community development. Whenever you're, uh, you know, complete with this um, uh, with this PowerPoint here on yeah. where that income level um, isn't as um, as a defined number as as it might sound. Um, and I don't know. So whenever whenever you're ready. Uh, or whenever you get through this on on advising on 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 the details and how to apply, then um, you know I kind of got a few questions. I'm actually done. I'm actually done with this. This is the last okay. slide. Is 2021 annual action plan, and there are a bunch of organizations essentially probably lining up to uh, right. get this. But the application is still open, and you guys, if you know any charities who are interested, you could uh, you could go ahead and tell them to reach the uh, the city and uh, essentially the staff are ready to give them the, the information. Uh, okay. I'm going to stop sharing this and would like to see what you have to share with us. I hope okay. you can share. Can you share uh, your screen? Yeah, I'm, go I'm actually going to in a minute, but I want to start with, um, so the, from what I understand, I'm not on the, on the committee uh, as Dr. Farisadi is, so I get this information handed to me, you know, this week on the agenda for a vote on Monday. So I, I do have some catching up to do. Um, and, and, and it's a lot to take in, but from going, from watching the committee meetings, from what I understand is, you know, the, the argument seems to be now this time that instead of doing the couple months of focusing on low to, um, uh, very, low. What I, very low income, um, that they're just going to allow moderate income to apply from the, from the very start. Well, from the discussions is, you know, and, and that level is at 69,000. Uh, however, uh, from what I understand and what, and what uh, was being told by the city staff during the meeting is that this looks, the way that's determined is it looks at a three month history, uh, income history. And so w uh, one of the arguments being made was, well, you could have somebody that was making, um, 69,000, um, you know, and, but over the three month period, you know, they, they would eventually fall into the very low income. So, um, we wanted, to, they wanted to include them also. Um, or somebody who makes $200,000. Yeah, that, that was, that was the one. Wow. So I kind of did the math on, I said, well, if you're going to let, if you're going to consider the moderate people dropping to the low, well, then, uh, the, the, we're going to have to accept the equal side of the high income people dropping to the moderate and then qualifying. So doing the math on that, uh, I came up with just over $200,000. If you made over just $200,000 and uh, in the month of, we'll just say in the month of January, and then you lost your job at the month, at the end of January, by the end of March, you are now in the moderate um, income level and 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 qualified for this money um you know whether so you know it, i guess it's and that's part of the debate is is someone uh that was at that income probably better uh in a better position to weather the storm and not in need of immediate assistance as somebody that maybe was making twenty five thousand dollars a year uh thirty thousand has a family of four and lost their job, um, so that's a lot of the discussion of, and and that was part of the you know uh, reason why last time it was low income uh, for a while, and then if money was left, we'd expand to the moderate. But that was kind of rejected this time. Um, and I got a video that I'm going to share a screen with, and maybe ask you a few questions and have you explain, because uh, you did give your point of view, um, kind of gives what they were talking about, and then it gives your point of view, Dr. Farisadi, 
and uh, we'll kind of see what, um, kind of pick your brain on that, see if this works. Are yeah, you getting that? Cool. Yeah, right. I can see that. Council Member uh, Brummer, Council, uh, Council Member Brummer. Yep. Uh, Yes, thank you. And I'll be supporting the motion because I feel like this is pandemic money. And like um, Council Member Newland discussed, these are people who could have had, um, you know, a moderate income a couple months ago, but because of pandemic uh, employment, uh, their job is newly affected by the economy. And we um, want to make sure that we're catching as many people as we can in the second round and not making unnecessary restrictions. So I appreciate keeping the net broad, catching everyone that we can. And um, I really appreciate the capital fund being able to help the businesses hunt down their paperwork and having that extra um, that extra help and that extra support as you know we're trying to get them through this process easier. So I really appreciate that and the outreach and then rethinking about how we're connecting with our small businesses. I think this is still a good time for us to think about um, how handy it would be if we had a business licensing program through the city. So there's my plug. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Ferrisani. Thank you. It's, it's once again, it's kind of interesting to me. We are saying we tried this and it doesn't work. It didn't, it didn't work. Who do you have no evidence of that? Your individual assistance has not been distributed. You have no idea whom they are distributing it to. I guarantee you those charitable foundations will find low and very low income families to give this money to. Your business uh, allocation has been given for a good amount out already. And as the communication triggers down, there would be more and more of these businesses who employ low and very low income individuals to come forward. It's amazing to me that we are not paying attention to the metric and we are just following a level of assumptions that I don't see evidence for it. Uh, the program as it was organized has no side effects. If they didn't apply, it would go automatically to the next tier. It's not as important as acting fast, it's important to act accurate and give it to deserving people. And everything at the county level, at the national level tells you that there is a lot of pressure on somebody who makes $25,000, $30,000 a year for a family compared to a moderate income family, which I believe is hovering around $80,000. Maybe and it's definitely true that some moderate income families have lost their job, but just simple buffering that financial capacity that they, it might exist for them puts them at a different category than a family of four which lives on $30,000. And that's the exact very same industry that has been hit. Hospitality industry, all of these news that you see about lower income American families being in absolute need. And it amazes me that my colleague from Ward 1 doesn't see the number of applications from her ward being at the top. And essentially, if that directs you to the need there, and if we have put it in low and very low income bracket, therefore there is a lot of need in that bracket right there. Well, which again, is not completely excluding moderate income families. It just prioritizes towards the low and very low income individuals. One more time, let's pay attention to the reality on the ground. If you have, if you are making, and Julie could correct me if I'm wrong, if you are making $35,000 and you have a family of three or four, you are in low or very low income uh, bracket. When we talk, correct, okay. When we talk about moderate income family, we are talking about a family which is upwards of 80, isn't it? As far as I remember. A family of four. Or 84,000, 85,000. A family of four is considered moderate income at um, $68,800. Okay, so 68, eight versus somebody who makes $25,000, which is a lot of people out there. 
there is, again, I have been in communication and they are in need of even paying for their gas bill during this winter. So if, if, we are at, if we are saying that we don't see the program working, there is no evidence for that because we don't know where the individual money is gonna land, family assistance is gonna land, and our business, $300,000 have been going out, and I propose to you that with better communication with the small businesses, which is small businesses, these micro entities, according to the new classification, are, I guarantee you, majority of micro entities, small businesses, have employees which, have, which are low and very low income. It's just, it's just the nature of things. I just think that we have no reason not to, not to focus it on the most vulnerable uh, sector of the people of Overland Park. Let's focus on getting it to the hand of the people rather than hypothetically speeding it up. But at, this end of, at the end of the story, if you all wanna go that way, I'm not gonna stand in front of it because we just need to, to help people. Thank you. Okay, so um, you kind of heard the discussion there, and I'll, I'll, I'll preface this by, by talking about what else I heard on this meeting. And most of the discussion on the meeting was about uh, maybe the way uh, that we went wrong distributing the information and not getting this information to the right people. Um, so, um, if, if, if my take on it was what it sounded like is their solution to the communication was just to widen the income gap, um, which, like I said, it, it, you know, if it, in the calculations, uh, which I did to fall into the, you know, if, if it's taken over a three month period, you're essentially looking at uh, if you you made fifteen thousand in the last three months, that could have all been in January. It could have been in half of January. You could have had a half million dollar job and and got fired on the fifteenth or laid off on the fifteenth, um, and, and you you would end up by the end of that three months qualifying in this moderate. Um, so uh, the 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 sliding scale of that um and then if i grasp i think maybe i'll have you d explain a little your point of view dr ferrisati but it, it seems to me like um um what it sounds like you're still proposing that that we that we stick with the low income for the first couple of months i mean the, the money doesn't have to be distributed till sometime in september of next year i think you're on mute there yeah, September next year. That's you. I mean, you said it perfectly. The first allocation, I argued that low and very low income families would be prioritized. Then some of the same council members that you see arguing right now, they put a two months expiration on it. I agreed with it. Okay. We just move forward with it. So for low and very low income families for the first two months, then they open it. This time they didn't even agree with that. And you can see representative of Ward 1 who is one of the most deserving wards actively arguing against it, which is amazing to me. Like uh, the reality is let's not duplicate what federal government learned by not giving money to a, you know, big corporate that then the corporate had to give it back. I don't want to name names. Let's just act with an attachment to the reality. Who is the most 220,000 people living in Overland Park? We have only $180,000 to dispense between individuals. Who's going to be the most needy? Obviously, low and very low income people. And then the business is the same story. So it was just uh, surprising to me that uh, three, four members, including the one that you showed, were very much arguing that, oh, we got to be fast. Who says we got to be fast? Who says accuracy and giving it to the hand of people who deserve it uh, is has more priority than being fast who what is the need to be fast rather than being active yeah they they they, and they alluded to the fact that it didn't work but they also discussed the reason was communication and getting the word out um so they kind of fixed a problem that they fixed a problem that wasn't they addressed a problem by fixing a problem we didn't have uh is is essentially how how i kind of saw it um it, Scott, so it didn't work was also inaccurate and irrelevant because 
our small business allocation, $300,000 of it evaporated immediately and small businesses with low and very low income took it. 100,000 is left. The reason was that the, one of some of the applicants had problems with their application. Okay, otherwise if they didn't have problems with their application, they would have been awarded. That's so, okay, so there's no problem there. The problem on the individual assistance program it was also non-existing because we haven't even distributed that yet. That has been allocated to these charities and I guarantee you, as I guaranteed for them, that a lot of deserving people will line up for that. So it didn't work was just, in my opinion, a manufactured reason because, uh, because they just did not want to prioritize low yeah. and very low income families. We, you know, and let's look at it from another perspective. If you are providing rent assistance to a low income family, it is, it is somewhat conceivable that the owners of the rental properties are medium income in individuals, other than the huge businesses, okay? In many cases, they, they could be you know, big corporates. But so therefore, this economic stimulus relieves the low and very low income individual, but also helps the medium income landlord and even maybe in the upper income, income landlord because he gets the rent or the mortgage essentially right so it's not like we are not helping the other sectors we just wanted to give priority to somebody who is wondering how to pay a trickle bill in this in this uh, winter when he has lost a job that even before pandemic was putting him at you know low income bracket right and and i did i did some some research and like we said in the beginning we're talking about what the HUD definitions of low and moderate is. And yes, this, this uh, grant is, you know, it's eligible to go to uh, low and moderate income, but it's the city's decision to, to disperse it how they please. And I looked at, at uh, a lot of other cities and a lot of other cities, you know, like Dr. Farisati said or proposed was, you know, let's just f focus it two months on the, the first two months on, on the, the low income. And then if there's money left, we'll open it up to, to the moderate. Well, the other cities I looked at, I could hardly find any, most everyone I saw just took moderate off the list and just said, this is, you know, if, if you qualify for uh, in the low income, uh, here's, a, here, here's some uh, stimulus for you. And this desperate times requires desperate actions. And again, like we are having this on the background of city, you know, the, the whole story of city applying for $400,000 to buy video cameras for soccer leagues. You know, when you, again, when you look at, you know, when you look at you, when you look at it, sometimes you just get the feeling that we are somewhat detached from reality. You know, by the way, that $400,000 obviously didn't happen. City took the application back, but that application was to the county, was not to this mechanism, this mechanism. But again, all, every dollar, Scott, is the taxpayer's money. It right. doesn't matter, federal, county, city, every penny in the government is the taxpayer's money at the end of the day. So we are in this dilemma right now. We are in this dilemma right now. And if the, if the opportunity comes up, I am sure that Councilman Hamblin and, and I would argue one more time for prioritizing low and very low income families. The other thing that, Scott, if you give me one more second, I wanted to show you is this portion of it, which I, it didn't come up during that conversation, but it should come up during the next conversation. And this is the other one, which is 6% administrative costs for the city of Overland Park. I am not, what is your take on that? Like, what is that, what is that all about? Um, well, when, when we got the community capital fund on the business, um, my question is, we're paying 12% to that community capital fund. So now are we at 18 um, when we add the city administration cost on there? Or since the community capital fund is only doing the uh, business, business side, is it only 6% of the 186? I don't believe that's the case. Um, so, yeah, um, it, you know, we're paying somebody 12%. I don't know why we would take six uh, for ourselves, but um, 
you know. Right. So uh, the argument there was that you know there is overtime and stuff like that. But again, I am a little bit again. This is not exactly a super jolly situation to to you know to be relaxed about it. So if we are handling the job over another charity to distribute it, paying them 10, 12 percent. And also for the individual assistance, we are handling it over to uh, those uh, four charities to distribute it. Then maybe we could just let go of this six percent. Six percent is not is not one percent. Is you know six percent of seven hundred thousand dollars. That's forty thousand dollars, and that could help a heck of a lot of people. Actually. Yeah, and when like you said, we're handing this money over to the charities who's making their own applications, distributing it themselves, and I haven't seen anything about them taking a cut. Yeah, uh, there, is a, there is a website called uh, Navig Charity Navigator, because in cancer research, we deal with a lot of charities who raise money and then they probably they look for scientists to come and apply. For example, they are focused on ovarian cancer or lung cancer. And this Charity Navigator usually helps us a lot to understand who's administration cost is how much is the administration cost. And I can tell you if somebody, if some charity goes there and is at 18% administration cost, okay? So let's just think about the way we distribute this. 12% has to go to certain entity to dispense it. 6% I'm gonna charge, so 18% administrative cost. The charity navigator is not gonna give them a very good rank, let me, let me tell you that much. And so I'm hoping that with your help, Councilman, we could, uh, we could argue against that 6% should the opportunity rise. Another thing which is continuation of your video is that I'm still arguing and the Ward 1 representative puts an end to the discussion by pulling a procedure of maneuver called calling into question. Calling into question according to Robert rules cuts the discussion and forces a vote essentially. And we are seeing that practice on us repeatedly when we keep providing yeah. reasoning, isn't it? Yeah, and when, and if, uh, we'll see a motion made early in the discussion process and they'll prove their points. If, you know, and it seems like if someone's making a good counterpoint to, to the motion, we'll get a call to question and uh, that'll, put it, that'll put an end to, you know, that'll suppress the opposition. Um, right, so you know, procedural maneuver to not let the opposition voiced their opinion. It's not supposed to be like that. It's, I, can, I can tell you, during the last four years, I never heard of calling to question. Yeah, and we've <laughs> seen it a lot. A yeah, lot. now suddenly it's, it's <laughs> a new thing. Maybe it's in a style. Maybe. <laughs> but again, I appreciate your, uh, your attention to this and the extremely important points that you raised. But we, are, we will try again unless they don't give us an opportunity, like they don't bring the item back, we will try again. I think the item comes back as I spoke to our staff. <clears throat> and I invite you, uh, Scott, to please be on that, uh, like come on that meeting. meeting. You're not to, into city committee, but obviously you have, you could be a guest council member, so to speak. Absolutely. So, so we could discuss this and hopefully we could try to convince them to get it to the hand of most deserving people in this holiday time in this Christmas time and uh, during the next year. Absolutely. All right. Any closing comments, sir? No, it's, um, you know, glad to see the uh, 2020 coming to an end. And everybody is. Or Every a better 21. Everybody. I have never heard <laughs> on radio that they insult a year. Yeah. And first time I heard on NPR that they called 2020 garbage which was amazing to me to, you know, the, uh, it's that emotional, I guess, but luckily it's coming to an end with good note, thanks to the efforts of scientists, thanks to the efforts of people who establish good policies, you know, what I'm trying to say. So uh, I hope that we could follow a policy that helps the people of Overland Park. It's evidence-based, it's logic-based, and is in attachment with reality. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. You have a great Sunday. Thank you for being here. I appreciate Thank it. You. And I look forward to our other conversation series. Yep, as always. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>